Good day, everyone, and a warm welcome to today's global webinar by DNV Maritime, uh, which we've titled Maritime Forecast 2050, Ship Technologies, Fuels and Fuel Production in Focus. My name is Margaret Andersen, and I head up the external communications team here at DNV Maritime. On behalf of the presenters and myself, I would like to thank you all very much for attending, and we hope that you find today's session interesting and enlightening. Now, wherever you are in the world of maritime these days, decarbonisation is sure to be high on the agenda. And it is clear that the action we take now will influence the direction of decarbonisation efforts in the future. And so how can we make sure that we set the right course to achieve a sustainable future? Our latest maritime forecast to 2050 it might not hold all the answers, but we hope it will help you take better informed decisions. In our latest report, and indeed in today's session, we offer an out updated outlook on key drivers for decarbonisation, including regulations, technologies, as well as fuel production and demand. In other words, we put the spotlight on the challenges that need tackling to decarbonise shipping. Let me introduce you to our presenters today. We have Eirik Ovrum. He is a principal consultant in our advisory team. Uh, he's also the lead author of our Maritime Forecast to 2050 report. Joined Joining us is also Tori Longva, uh, Decarbonisation Director in our Regulatory Affairs team. And before I let them loose on the presentation, I um, will give you a quick overview of what we will cover in this session. So, um, on the agenda is a look at the key drivers and regulations related to the decarbonisation of shipping. We're looking at ship technologies and fuels, fuel demand in particular and production, including a comprehensive mapping of carbon neutral fuel projects. We also have two case studies on technologies that might drive decarbonisation for shipping. Uh, this includes onboard carbon capture and storage and nuclear propulsion. And uh, towards the end, we'll have a Q&A as mentioned. So uh, we're ready to go. And with this, I would like to welcome our first presenter to the virtual stage. Hi, Eric, over to you. Thank you, Magata. So the Maritime Forecast 2050 is one out of the NV's suite of energy transition outlook reports. And this is the seventh edition and uh, last year we concluded that the development of sustainable fuel supply chains must be accelerated in order to achieve the transition. And with that in mind, the last year we've done a lot of work trying to map out the production of carbon neutral fuels. And seeing challenges ahead, we have also started looking into uh, technologies to reduce the need for carbon neutral fuels. So in this year's report, we explore the new IMO goals and regulations for ship, ship emissions. We present analysis from this thorough mapping of existing and planned production of carbon neutral fuels. And to further assess fuel production and real decarbonisation, we look at well to wake emissions of future marine fuels. And we see that it is necessary to continue exploring all technologies for reducing energy consumption of ships and fuels for decarbonising shipping. And therefore, we this year provide an in-depth look at onboard carbon capture and nuclear propulsion. And uh, Tore Longva will now <laughs> take over. Thank you, Eric, and uh, good day to all of you. I'm very pleased to be here today and uh, present uh, this year's edition of the Maritime Forecast to 2050. So, uh, in each uh, edition, we have a thorough review of the latest development of um, drivers for decarbonisation, meaning both regulatory drivers, but also uh, commercial and financial drivers. And it's safe to say that uh, this, this last year has seen significant development on the regulatory side. In the EU, we have two new key legislations being adopted. That is the inclusion of shipping in the emission trading system, setting a price on greenhouse gas emissions uh, for uh, ships trading internationally in and out of EU and in the EU. We also have a, um, the fuel EU regulation, which uh, comes into force in 2025, which is um, 
setting greenhouse gas intensity requirement, a well to wake intensity requirement on fuels used in shipping. So these are regulations that will come uh, very shortly, uh, but also the IMO has made significant progress in the review of its greenhouse gas strategy that happened in July uh, this year. Um, the initial strategy came in 2018 with a target of 50% uh, reduction of greenhouse gases by 2050. And this target is now significantly strengthened to, read, uh, uh, to aim for a net zero greenhouse gas emission by 2050 for shipping. Um, that implies uh, both a significant strengthening of the reduction, but also that it includes the life cycle or well to wake emissions, which is implied by the wording of net zero. In addition to the target for 2050, we also have what's called indicative checkpoints for 2030 and 2040, which set the pace of the um, decarbonization. So not only for the ultimate target in 2050, but also for 2030 and 2040, we have significant reduction target. A 20% reduction in 2030, striving for 30% um, um, is a quite a significant amb uh, ambition because it's so short time before 2030 uh, to ramp up the fuel production and also all the technology that can be used. And for 2040, a 70% reduction striving for 80% means that acceleration of uptake of the carbonization technologies need to happen in the 2030s. This is a strategy only, it doesn't set a requirement for individual ships. That's also included uh, in the strategy, a timeline for how, when this uh, should come into force. So we expect regulations to come to be adopted in 2025 and enter into force in 2027. And on the agenda, we have a greenhouse gas intensity requirement, a well to wake uh, as well, uh, very similar to what the EU has adopted and also a, an economic element, um, could be a carbon price, a greenhouse gas um, levy, uh, it could other, be other kinds of setting a price on greenhouse gas emissions globally. So that's is, uh, setting the pace of the decarbonization, uh, both in the short term and also in the long term. So if you look at uh, what these drivers has uh, done uh, with the shipping market or the uh, shipbuilding market, we see that ship owners are already investing in uh, uh, alternative uh, technology. 6.5% um, of ships uh, in terms of gross tons can now operate on alternative fuels and more than half of the order brook uh, uh, is filled with uh, such ships. Uh, and this is a significant increase from last year, which had a, to up from 5.5% uh, ships in operation. And the last year, uh, only a third, or only a third uh, was uh, the order of the order book was on alternative fuels. When I say alternative fuels, uh, I mean specifically the uh, molecule. So it is either uh, methane or methanol, ammonia or hydrogen or batteries being different from the conventional fuel or gas oils. But this doesn't imply that the ship will actually run on a carbon neutral fuel. You can still run on diesel fuel or gas oil because these are dual fuel engines, but it could also run on uh, fossil methanol or fossil uh, LNG. Um, but at least it shows a capability of running on alternative molecules. And similarly, ships that run on a conventional gas or fuel oil is not uh, limited to fossil fuel either. We have biofuels, we have synthetic uh, fuels as well that can be used on these ships. Um, another point here is that we see a significant acceleration, as we've seen already from last year, there's a big difference. Um, when you look at the ships in operation at the bottom here, we see that this is, uh, is a transition taking place. And up till now, uh, mostly in, in the container shipping, uh, to some degree tankers and also on car carriers. Um, but we see that the, the technology is also spreading to, to other segments.
Another aspect is also the energy consumption. So one thing is to be able to run on alternative uh, fuels and to actually buy and use uh, carbon neutral fuels, but a lot of uh, reduction can also be taken by energy consumption or energy efficiency. So since uh, alternative energy will be scarce and expensive, we see that this is a very important element. Uh, it, could, it could contribute to almost a third of the, the reductions. In itself, it will only be able to stabilize the emissions uh, at the same level, even with increased activity. Uh, but of course, it will be an important element to reduce the cost for, uh, for ship owners. So this uh, makes it very important. So with that, I hand over to Eric again. Thank you, Tore. And there is a, it says a range of measures to either reduce energy consumption or to reduce emissions related to energy use. And saving energy will be valuable no matter which fuel you will use in the future as they're all projected to come with higher costs than today's fossil fuels. And as uh, Sture said, there might be shortages of the fuels that a given ship owner would like to use. And in that sense, you should use as little fuel as possible. In this year's report, we discussed the status of six technologies chosen out of many investigated by the industry that can contribute to the decarbonization of shipping. We look at three technologies for reducing energy consumption. We look at <clears throat> wind assisted propulsion, which can see a nice picture of here on the screen, which is uh, really uh, having a lot of promise and quite a few projects that are starting to use this. We look at air lubrication systems, which has quite a few uh, projects or uh, ships already on order book and uh, sailing with this technology. And we look at solid oxide fuel cells, which has to have the potential to convert fuels with higher efficiency than internal combustion engines. And the solid oxide fuel cells, they have been under development for many years, and they are, have demonstrated high efficiency in labs outside of real uh, ship environment. But the, and there, the new thing now is that there are several projects on the way that have the potential to demonstrate on a real ship in real operation, a higher, higher, significantly higher efficiency than internal combustion engine. And this, uh, so if these projects are successful in a few years, we may have demonstrated the performance. And at that point, uh, commercial commercialization of the technology can start and perhaps bring cost hopefully bring costs down and this uh, this story is significant for uh, almost all the technologies that we need to decarbonize shipping we need development demonstration of performance and then commercialization in order to be uh, useful for a larger fleet in addition, we also look at three fuel technologies. We look at liquid hydrogen, where there is a lot of development on tanks for storing liquefied hydrogen. And we look further into onboard carbon capture and nuclear propulsion. Today, shipping consumes about 280 million ton oil equivalent of fuel annually. Almost all fossil fuels, only 0.1% of the fuels used is uh, uh, biofuels. And it's not really clear that these biofuels would be approved for use under, under new well to wake emission regulations either. And here you can see the results of a comprehensive mapping of existing and planned production of carbon neutral versions of fuel oil, methane, methanol, hydrogen and ammonia. And these project products can be used as carbon neutral fuels by ships, but they can also be used by other industries or as fuels 
or for other industrial uses. For example, ammonia is used in fertilizer production and methanol in the chemical industry. So therefore, we do not focus only on projects aiming to provide fuel for ships, but we look at all projects that aim to produce a product that can be used as carbon neutral fuel for ships. And we have mapped more than 2,200 relevant projects that are at different stages of development, from just being announced, to having done the final investment decision, to being in operation. And to estimate the amounts that can be produced in each of the coming years of carbon neutral fuels, we have assigned a likelihood to each project of being completed. And we have two sets of likelihoods for a high and a low total estimate based on each project's current development stage. And looking towards 2030, this figure shows our high and low estimates of global cross-sector carbon neutral fuel supply for all industries. And we compare this to the estimated demand for carbon neutral fuels from shipping. 30 to 40 percent of the estimated cross-sector global carbon neutral fuel supply is needed for shipping to reach its projected demand of 17 million ton oil equivalent of carbon neutral fuels by 2030 to meet IMO's goals. In comparison, shipping consumes only about 3% of the world's energy use. And I will now hand the word over back to Tore. Thank you. And um, as already mentioned, uh, when we talked about the, the greenhouse gas strategy by the IMO, it explicitly states that it sh the reduction should be done within the boundaries of the energy system of shipping. And that implies uh, also specifically uh, belt to wake uh, emissions. So when uh, Eric talks about uh, carbon neutral fuels, that is exactly what we mean in a belt to wake perspective. It is uh, um, net zero or zero emissions. Uh, it, has, it has many names, but um, um, it has to be a significant reduction uh, on also the production side to fulfill these uh, requirements. So as we see in the picture here, um, different sources for, for fuels could be uh, biomass, uh, which is considered carbon neutral. Uh, we have uh, electrofuels made from electricity, again made from renewable uh, sources. And you have the blue fuels, which are made from reforming fossil uh, energy, fossil fuels to hydrogen and then storing the carbon. And all of these sources can be used to make the different fuels, uh, the fuel oils, uh, methanol, uh, methane, ammonia, hydrogen, and also used directly as electricity. Um, in order to achieve this reduction, uh, there is a need for having a certified fuel. You need to ensure that um, the fuel you get is actually produced in a sustainable manner. You cannot uh, see that uh, on the surface uh, of just testing the fuel. Uh, it's something that needs to be followed up directly in the fuel production chain. So that is something that will be needed for the IMO regulations. Uh, IMO is working on the guidelines in that, that respect and also for uh, fuel EU maritime and also for EU ETS, um, which will be using the EU's uh, system uh, uh, based on the renewable energy directive. In the uh, forecast, you will also find a table in the appendix looking at different fuel standards and incentive schemes globally. So we also have the different systems in um, in other uh, countries, like in the US, we have in, in, in Asia, uh, several places for um, uh, these standards. To show you kind of the impact, uh, we have made a, um, a simple uh, simulation where we looked at uh, the uh, belt to wake emissions. Um, so the blue one here is the belt to tank or onboard combustion emissions, sorry, the tank to wake, and the yellow is the belt to tank emission from the production. Today, with the fossil fuels, uh, mostly fuel oil and gas oil and some energy, 
about 15% of emissions comes from the production side and from the extraction of the fossil fuel. So without any regulations uh, and, and standards in this regard, we could anticipate that the production of uh, biofuels have a lot of land use emissions, um, the e-fuels could be made from uh, fossil electricity and so on, and any reduction that you achieve on the onboard side is negated by increasing the fuel production emissions. So this is why it's important to have these standards to ensure that the fuels used in, in shipping adheres to uh, a limitation on, on, on the emissions. And of course, today we have quite a lot of experience with certifying biofuels, uh, and we need the same for the electrofuels and, and the blue fuels as well. So then I hand back to Eric. So, <clears throat> our class six uh, technologies we look at this year. We have performed a case study on onboard carbon capture and nuclear propulsion for a 15,000 TEU container vessel sailing between the Far East and Europe. So uh, when we combust fuels containing carbon, such as uh, fuel oil, LNG, LPG, and methanol, we produce CO2 that today is emitted to the atmosphere. And after reducing energy consumption, the solutions fall into three categories. Using fuels without carbon, using sustainable carbon to produce fuels, or capturing CO2 from the from combustion. It, not, neither of these solutions are better than the others. The only thing that matters for the climate is the amount of increased CO2 or greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Biofuels, electrofuels, and blue fuels are all highly sought after by other industries. For example, biofuels in aviation, renewable electricity for the grid, hydrogen, ammonia, and methanol for other industrial uses. By using onboard carbon capture or nuclear propulsion, ship owners can avoid the competition for sustainable biomass and renewable electricity. And carbon capture for land-based industries is mature. That's what you use whenever you have a soda or a beer. And storage for CO2 is being built out. With projections for global annual storage capacity of CO2 in 2050, being multiples of shipping's total emissions today. Still, we would need uh, to build out the infrastructure for receiving and sequestering marine CO2. And storing CO2 on the ship, uh, ship requires space. As we can see on this ship, uh, which is will be a pilot, it's an existing ship that will have this pilot installation started in 2024. That's the plan. We store the CO2 here in the front, capture it in the rear. So it requires space. Yet we find it technically feasible for our case study ship, the container vessel, capturing 70% of CO2, storing it in 4,000 cubic meters of tanks, and offloading the CO2 four times per round trip. With similar use of extra volume as when using LNG as fuel, because in our case study we use heavy fuel oil, if we had used LNG rather than heavy fuel oil and carbon capture, we would need 12,000 cubic meters of LNG tanks. And when capturing 70% of CO2, this ship can still be net zero with zero well to wake emissions when blending in the appropriate amount of bio MGO or electro MGO. And uh, onboard carbon capture is the only solution that can take you negative. If you run on 100% biofuels and capture 50%, for example. But of course, that will come at a high cost. And the technology is being developed. 
with research projects on the way on this ship, uh, the Clipper EOS by the chemical tanker company Solvang is planned to have a full scale high capture rate installation tested in 2024. The case study ship is operating from 2030 to 2060 with zero carbon intensity from 2050. And the baseline to compare against is found using four technologies, each one blending in the appropriate amount of carbon neutral fuels to meet the emission reduction requirements. So we have a regular conventional fuel oil ship, LNG, methanol and ammonia. And we have five different scenarios for fuel prices with different fuel prices every year for these fuels. That gives us 20 different lines for annual costs that are hidden within this gray band on the figure. Capturing CO2 on the ship requires extra energy use on board called a fuel penalty. So what typically is happening, and it depends a little bit on the technologies being uh, developed. Typically, you would have the, with the heavy fuel oil, you will have a first a scrubber to get rid of the sulfur. The exhaust goes up the scrubber, that goes down again and up a second column. And this time, you will uh, have a, a substance, a solvent, that will uh, the CO2 will be captured by. And then this solvent will go down and you will need to heat it to release the CO2 from that solvent. This requires energy and you will have to drive the fans and pumps and so on. In addition, you have to liquefy or somehow store the CO2 on board, which also requires energy. So this extra energy use is called a fuel penalty. It will vary greatly between different ship types, especially considering the extra amount of heat you have on board. This is why we have different scenarios for the onboard carbon capture fuel penalty. In addition to the fuel penalty, the other most significant economic factor is the, that you will have to pay to get the CO2 offloaded, transported away and sequestered. A few first movers may get to get paid to deliver CO2 as, the, as it is actually a commodity today. But if this takes off in a large scale, uh, most of the ship owners will have to pay to do this. So we construct a low cost CCS scenario where we consume 15% additional fuel to capture 70% of CO2. And we pay $40 per ton of CO2 offloaded. And the high cost scenario with the 30% fuel penalty and $80 per ton deposit cost. And the case study shows that onboard carbon capture can compete with the other proposed decarbonization solutions. Approximately 700 nuclear reactors have been used on ships and submarines since the first, Amer the first nuclear powered vessel. The American submarine Nautilus was launched in 1955. So today, 160 vessels with 200 reactors are in operation. And the nuclear industry is developing small modular reactors. And looking at the dimensions and weights of these, we find it's technically feasible to be used for our case study vessel. With decarbonization, marine industry actors are looking at using these nuclear reactors for merchant vessels and companies are planning pilots for the early 30s. While recognizing that there are barriers to its universal implementation such as development of new reactors suitable for a commercial environment, port access, regulations and public perception. For the case study ship, we assume leasing of the reactor at a fixed annual cost. The low and high react reactor capex based on historical prices from land-based nuclear power. The leasing cost is calculated as an annuity loan over the lifetime of the ship 
at 8% interest, resulting in the two scenarios annual cost seen here. And the case study shows that nuclear propulsion can compete with other proposed decarbonization solutions, especially in a net zero regulatory regime, both for onboard carbon capture and nuclear propulsion for merchant vessels. The technologies need development and maturation. Our key findings are that strengthened IMO ambitions and the first international CO2 price in the EU set shipping's decarbonization pathway. By 2030, this will require 30 to 40 percent of global cross sector carbon neutral fuel supply. Today, Half the order tonnage can use LNG, LPG, or methanol as fuel in dual fuel engines, but global fuel production standards are needed to meet IMO's net zero by close to 2050 goal. And onboard carbon capture and nuclear are technically and economically feasible options. The implications of this is that fuel producers must accelerate plans, but they need offtake commitments from fuel buyers. And reducing energy consumption is critical to lowering emissions and softening the impact of increased energy costs. And this fuel and technology shift will require large scale training of seafarers, no matter which technologies and fuels are the winners. Going forward, further regulatory clarity and commercialization of new technologies is required. And the cost of decarbonization must be carried through the maritime value chain by green corridors or similar mechanisms. And the 2020s is indeed proving to be the decisive decade for decarbonization of shipping. Finally, our recommendations are that ship owners should reduce energy consumption now, consider all decarbonization options, focus on fuel flexibility, and consider long-term fuel strategies. Thank you, and over to you, Margeta. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eirik. Uh, and now we thought we would uh, hand it back to the audience for a quick poll to get a sense of what you guys think the future holds for certain near-zero fuels or technologies. So, uh, as you can see, we have a poll up on the screen that we ask uh, that you all click your preferred answer to. Um, so the question is, which zero or near zero fuel or technology do you think will be available at scale in 2030? Uh, the options are biofuel, e-fuels, blue fuels, onboard carbon capture and storage and energy efficiency. Uh, so if you could all add your answer in, then we can um, maybe get a quick comment from Eric when we have the final result. Let's see, yeah, we've got a pretty clear sense of findings here. Uh, so the poll results show 31% for biofuels, 34% for energy efficiency options. Um, any comment from you there on this, uh, Eirik? Well, it's um, quite similar to earlier this morning, and uh, yeah. it's clear that the energy efficiency is will be crucial. It's, uh, we have to save no matter what, which one we use, and it will be very interesting to see how uh, carbon capture can scale for, for for ships as well as other industries. Okay, great. Thank you very much. And then um, before we move over to the Q&A, uh, I wanted to make you all aware of some of the resources that are available on our website. Um, if you don't mind switching, thank you very much. Uh, so obviously we are, we've been talking a lot about the Maritime Forecast of 2050 today, uh, and that is available on our website. Um, and of there are other elements as well, in particular, the Alternative Fuels Insight Platform, or AFI for short. You'll see in the bottom row there, the uh, second from the right box. Uh, this is a great source for all things alternative fuels. Um, and it can, the platform can provides a complete overview of 
the development and uptake of alternative fuels and technology. So that's uh, worth a visit. Um, again, the slides will be shared after the uh, um, presentation, so all of these resources will be uh, made available to you. So let's turn to some questions from the audience. We've had a few ticking in already. Um, maybe let's stick on the topic of uh, fuel. Uh, we've got one here um, looking at um, what the bottleneck might be for carbon neutral, carbon free fuel types in the future. Um, in particular, with the updated directives from the EU related to taxation and penalties related to fossil fuels, and perhaps other factors such as feedstock or green energy will be more prominent as bottlenecks. Uh, one for you, I think, Eirik. Yeah, uh, in, in the appendix of the report, you can find uh, two figures on, on biofuels from a study we did uh, this spring. And uh, I think uh, one of the conclusions from the, that work was that uh, rather than seeing a high ceiling to the potential of how much biomass can be used for biofuels, it will be many years of development of supply chains of biomass to making biofuels to supply it to industries before we reach this ceiling. So it's it's uh, quite similar, I would say, more similar to, to supplying electric fuels through renewable electricity and then hydrogen and then fuels than previously considered because there will be many years before we reach the higher levels of what's uh, possible. So I think mm -hmm. Developing this is a crucial bottleneck, but you know we what we also see and try and we don't give an answer to this in this year's work. But the, these other industries they want it, they need it, they need to decarbonize. So uh, and there is a, it's not an unlimited number of engineers companies working on this on resources. So I think that's uh, will be that will be a crucial bottleneck. Hmm. Uh, let's stick on fuels for the moment. There's also a question here about the use of biofuels to offset the emissions in the short term while more structured solutions uh, are yet to, to be feasible. Uh, some comments on that? Eirik, perhaps? Well, it will be, it will be, they will be expensive. So, I mean, mostly it will be cheaper to save on energy rather if you can so that's always the the preferred option it should be but um, i think uh, uh, biofuels will be with us forever because uh, some biofuels are made from wastes that we will never lose for example um, treating uh, sewage or uh, la household food waste Treating those will can make biogas, which will make can make bio LNG. So some of these biofuels will be with us forever. Uh, to what degree? Mm. To what great? Uh, to what extent? It's hard to see, but um, yeah, it won't only be as a short-term stepping stone. I think. No. Okay. Um... One here, I think maybe for Tura, uh, since the total amount of EUAs available on the market is reduced yearly, is there uh, a risk of an owner not being able to surrender the amount of EUAs he or she is required to for a given year? Well, ultimately, the, the uh, amount of allowances on the market should be so low that it's uh, not possible, but this will happen gradu gradually. And uh, the EU is also monitoring the, uh, the supply of allowances. And if there are too many allowances on the market and the prices go low, they can actually take away or don't release as much allowances on the market. And similarly, if there are too few. So in total, uh, the reduction should, should go down, but there are some flexibility year by year. But over time, there is a limitation. And there is expectation that uh, also through, for example, fuel in maritime, that the actual uh, demand for allowances will go down. Mm. And and there's there's a there's a short question here around uh, IMO regulations and whether domestic shipping will still be exempt 
from the IMO regulations. Perhaps you can clarify on that. Uh, well, yes, IMO is not um, regulating domestic shipping. That's uh, they they set the, the, um, the requirements for the international going fleet. So that's up to each member state to do so. So that varies quite a lot. Um, how the different uh, member states implement IMO regulation domestically. So, um, for example, in the EU, we have ETS and, and Fuelio Maritime, which also covers the domestic part. So, uh, this will be very individually, and I don't see this imposed by the IMO. And then we've got a couple of questions here on fuel flexibility, um, which I will ask to you, Eirik. One um, is asking, you mentioned that ship owners should remain flexible to different fuel types, but how might, might they go about this? Would this prevent people from committing to investing in a particular technology fuel type? That could be the case. You could have different uh, fuels used in a fleet, for example. Um, uh, if you had a pure LNG ship the last couple of years, then you had some issues with the high costs. And similar, there might be similar uh, periods of time where uh, uh, fuel oils are very expensive, but LNG is very low cost. So in that case, being fuel flexible, either in, in a ship or in a fleet, uh, is uh, beneficial in, in the economics. So this is simply mm. that we will uh, probably have uh, not only fluctuations in the fossil fuel markets, but when you run on, a, uh, if you are a new fuel LNG ship, let's say, you can run on fossil MGO, fossil LNG, but you can also run on bio MGO, electro MGO, and bio LNG, electro MGO, LNG. So you can choose the cheapest of these carbon neutral fuels as well. And maybe sometimes you won't even be able to get the one, but only the other. So in those cases, you actually would need the fuel flexibility to be able to comply so, so it's not only on the fossil fuels but also on, on the carbon neutral fuels you need to comply both in terms of costs and and, and to actually meet compliance yeah. and, and a follow-up question here how how do we convince our shareholders to invest in fuel flexibility when the new fuels as you've mentioned already are so much more expensive than fuel oil Yeah, <laughs> the challenge there. Tore. <laughs> I'll pass it well, over to you, Tore. You, you, you haven't answered as many as that. <laughs> no, <laughs> okay. No, but the, the, it's it's the alternative. Uh, it's um, the question of risk. Uh, if the ship becomes a stranded asset because you cannot get uh, compliant fuel to your ship, or that it would have to pay a significant penalty. Um, so it's a question of uh, where will the ship operate and what kind of fuel do you see uh, being available? I um, would strongly recommend to do specifically try to source fuel already now to, to see um, and also to look at what's been planned in the region and then uh, consider whether you need a fuel flexible ship because you don't know whether it will be a methanol or a diesel or a methane molecule that will be made available. So it is a question about risk uh, and not risking that the ship will be um, stranded as an asset. Mm. Um, and a, a little question here on CCS, um, well related to CCS. How high do we think the presumed percentage of ships that can be made more efficient through conversion? So be it CCS solution or hollow engine modification. How high the percentage of ships that can use onboard carbon capture? Is that the question? Or that can be more be made more efficient through conversion of some sort. So CCS is mentioned, but also any kind of hollow engine modifications. I guess playing to energy efficiency as well. Well, we have some. Uh, the, the, the most general answer is uh, given by the figure where we said that almost a third of energy emission reductions can come from different sorts of energy efficiency measures and a, a very wide range of uh, what ships can do individually or not. So uh, I would at least. Uh, 
consider uh, for new builds and uh, and uh, perhaps also existing fleets, uh, but especially for new builds, have a, uh, check the drawings and see if they can retrofit or or use uh, carbon carbon capture in the future, because that will require some extra space for storing the CO2 and for capturing the capture unit. And that can be a good hedge against not receiving enough carbon neutral fuels. Hmm. Maybe we uh, could uh, quickly mention the um, scrubber uptake. So we, uh, with the introduction of the sulfur requirements, we saw a, a retrofitting of um, three, four, five thousand ships. Hmm. Not saying that this is uh, directly applicable to CCS or other technologies, but it gives an indication of, uh, of uh, what's possible. Yeah. Um, there's a question here on, um, well, the preamble says battery storage or can provide over 20% energy efficiency improvement, yet new build vessels show a low adoption rate of this technology, which is well proven and commercially available. Do we have any thoughts as to why there is such a low adaptation rate? It's very individual for a given ship uh, how much you can save on using batteries. Mm. For uh, offshore vessels, uh, uh, often uh, using dynamic positioning around the platforms, you can have very large savings. If you are uh, running a ferry, you can uh, charge uh, every night and you can run uh, or two or three times a day, and then you can run on zero emissions or all, if you're all electric. But uh, for deep sea vessels, it's uh, very different how much they can save it all depends on their operational profile and how much uh, the variation and the load on the engines are and so on so we'll have mm -hmm. to do a quite thorough study on uh, on uh, what your given ship can do can gain from that in the broader market what are where are we regarding uh, ccs uh, onboard ccs development um what's the What's the perspective on when uh, of availability of such solutions? You think, Eric? Yeah. So, so uh, last year we provided a kind of an outlook on uh, on uh, different technologies and timelines, and uh, so uh, we see in terms of regulations uh, on ships, in terms of safety and so on, we don't foresee CCS to be a huge problem because it's not. Uh, toxic or or uh, explosive but you know there are definitely issues regarding safety that has to be fixed but not uh, as hard as for other versions in terms of uh, technology it has been tested on ships for small scale installation for capture with so-called catch and release i think <laughs> but and this uh, solvang ship will uh, that i showed the picture of will hopefully do a full scale high capture rate installation and we have other projects going, and uh, uh, it could be feasible, potentially be ready at the same time as other technologies, potentially, in terms of uh, what you need on the ship. Let's say uh, in two, three years time, it depends on uh, how fast they move and how successful the pilots are. So, uh, but, uh, and then of course you will need to develop the uh, infrastructure on land to be able to uh, store it, sequester it. So some of the first movers will be able to get contracts to actually sell this for you know, different kinds of use for CO2 in the industry, which is a commodity, which is being sold on the market. Uh, and then the, this uh, storage infrastructure will be de developed and this is ongoing already with uh, we have uh, projects in Norway, Denmark and different other places, uh, quite a few uh, all around the world that are looking at uh, developing this. So um, I think actually in terms of uh, onboard carbon capture has many of the similar same challenges as all the other solutions you have. Uh, you have uh, you need extra space on the ship. That's also the case for all the other alternative the alternative fuels. You need um, to develop the rules exactly how it's going to work out, and this is not fixed for all the others as well. Especially now that you get well to wake rules, and you need uh, uh, infrastructure and supply chains on land, either to produce the fuels or to capture the CO2. So it's 
it's a kind of similar similar problems for all of this and uh, yeah i could uh, be uh, ready on the same time order as uh, others i think possibly yeah. faster but, yeah i think there, there was a couple of questions on the infrastructure as well but i think you've answered that one already um uh, I'm going to hand over to Tore for a question on EU ETS. Uh, can it affect small ship owners worldwide uh, that cannot afford to adapt their fossil running vessels? Uh, well, of course, if you trade in the EU, um, then it, it will impact you. And, and there is a, simply put, a, a price on emissions uh, for uh, trading in and out of the EU. So, um, uh, of course, well, I'm not sure whether you mean smaller ships or smaller companies. Uh, of course, smaller ships are not included yet, will be included uh, over time, at least smaller general cargo ships and offshore ships. Um, but smaller companies, yes, they, they need to uh, carefully consider how to uh, uh, rearrange the contract, for example, to ensure that the, the cost of uh, ship being in, in the EU is uh, taken care of and, and reimbursed by, by the cargo owner. Um, and another question here on biofuels, which might be related here as a, as a drop-in solution requiring little to no vessel modification, uh, why does there seem to be a resistance or a lack of education in regards to biofuels or biodiesel? How can we increase the education, Eric? Well, there is uh, quite a few projects uh, testing using different kinds of biofuels now. And for, for uh, liquid biogas, it's uh, simple. That's already, well, there's no problem with that. It's the same molecule. But for the different uh, biodiesels, uh, and uh, uh, it's uh, another story. But it's still, it will add some, the challenges are much less than using new types of fuels altogether. But you have to make sure you do it uh, correctly because there are quite a few things that it can impact on the ship. And we had discussed this uh, in our uh, biofuel white paper, which can also can be downloaded somewhere on dnv.com. Uh, has an in introduction on this subject. Mm. I'm, I'm not okay, so sure uh, whether it's a... Um... It is a, quite a lot of attention on biofuels. Um, and of course, the regulations hasn't really given any credit until now with the IMOs. Um, there's a circular on the IMO specific, specifying where, what's required for getting credit. Uh, the ETS uh, will give a credit, um, fuel EU uh, as well. So you see a significant interest. This is the fuel that you can get hold of uh, immediately. It has to be a sustainable biofuel and needs to be certified as such and we see quite a lot of uh, education in the industry now on how to do this both operationally and and also sourcing the, the right type of biofuels so, so i think it's uh, it's coming okay uh, i think we've got time for a couple of more questions one is on wind assisted propulsion how how would you rate the potential of wind assisted propulsion eric and what what could what kind of savings could be made. Oh, I should remember the uh, <laughs> numbers we said in the in the report, but uh, I think we said something like uh, four to nine percent has already been achieved, and um, twenty up to twenty five percent could be achieved on the retrofits. But it's very individual. Uh, it's very individual, and how depends on how fast you have to get there and what routes you are trading on. And so on. Uh, if you have uh, the right weather patterns, you can be uh, in luck and have uh, huge savings. So uh, I think um, wind. I think it will have a huge, quite a large impact, uh, especially as in story. Story might uh, will also be used for the few EU maritime uh, to get some uh, credits there. So I think uh, wind, uh, you know. 10% is not, uh, it seems like not. it's not that much, but it's a huge deal to get 10% uh, reduction for shipping. If we manage to get that from ship, uh, from wind, that would be a, a huge good. Hmm. Okay, and I think I'm going to ask you one final question here. It actually refers to uh, the panel discussion during uh, the launch uh, of the report we had a week or so ago. And um, 
some of the industry leaders there said uh, that the IMO, reaching the IMO 2030 goals would be challenging, uh, but uh, more likely to achieve the 2050. Any, any comments on that before we sign off? So you, you're saying it's more likely to achieve the 2050 goal than the 2030? Yeah. Mm. Wow. Well, they are it's easy say to say at least. <laughs> yeah, well, they are challenging in, their, in slightly different ways. 20% uh, might not seem mm. as very much, but and we have already achieved 10%. Uh, but you will increase activity and uh, you have taken out a lot of the low hanging fruits on energy efficiency. So there's still quite a lot of effort in a very short time. That's the challenge of 2030. So, and also that regulations will not start coming into play before uh, uh, a couple of years. 2050 is a challenge in a very different way, also 2040, and that you need to scale up uh, the solutions, you need the volume, but you have better time with regulations and, and preparing. So uh, how you compare, I would say these are apples and pears almost. It's um, it's very different challenges and likelihood of yeah. Oh. Yeah, you have to be optimistic. It's possible, but challenging. And, and we are, we are in, you, know, you can only do so much and we're sitting in our bubble uh, you, uh, looking at shipping. It's not that small, but it's still only 3% of the world's total emissions. Going to 2050, if we are to reach all the other goals, there has to be a huge amount of work in other industrial sectors and uh, large scales reduction in those sectors and um, which ones will move first and uh, get the different resources that's uh, very very difficult uh, to predict much more difficult than uh, just looking at shipping and then you have to consider all these energy inefficiencies for example replacing uh, diesel using renewable electricity diesel on ships using renewable electricity is uh, very inefficient compared to replacing coal-fired power plants using renewable electricity. That's a much greater impact on the climate. So we have to you know, expect that this, these kinds of uh, weighing these thing, pros and cons and how the different uh, industries will move ahead with the decarbonization will have an impact, I think, in what shipping will be able to do mm. somehow. So we're all connected. Uh, and then, so with that, uh, we have arrived at the end of today's webinar. Thank you, Eirik. Thank you, Tora, uh, for your insights on, on these important topics. And, you know, this is a topic that will only continue to grow in importance uh, as the industry decarbonization journey continues. Um, as mentioned already, the webinar has been recorded. We will email you a link to access the webinar content in the next few days. All our webinars are available on our website as well. And I urge you all to download the report by visiting our website. Um, Eric, if you turn the slide, uh, we can also show a QR code. So if you have a chance, you can scan that uh, and that will take you straight to the report to download as well. Thank you all once again for attending. Take care and we look forward to seeing you again at our next webinar.